the ultimate way to block UBIT for self-directed IRA investors. Hey everyone, Adam Bergman here, tax attorney and founder of IRA Financial. On today's Adam Talks, we're going to be chatting about what is the best way to block UBIT. And UBIT is a ugly four-letter word that applies in various situations to tax exempt charities and self-directed IRAs, 401ks. And today's podcast, I wanted to give you my thoughts on really the best ultimate solution for blocking UBIT. Uh, unfortunately, there's really no way uh, to eliminate UBIT uh, entirely in most situations, but we're going to talk about what I think ultimately is the way people should go about blocking UBIT. So before we talk about that, obviously, I want to get into what exactly is UBIT? Uh, how is it triggered in an IRA or 401k? Uh, I've talked about this on many, many, many videos, podcasts, and blogs, just because it's such an important topic for IRA and 401k investors. Unfortunately, many, many investors just not educated sufficiently on the tax implications of triggering UBIT. So I want to just kind of focus on that again and re reinforce its importance and understanding for IRA and 401k investors. So um, let's go back in time well, to approximately the 50s or so when the UBIT rules were put in the tax code. Initially, it's far in advance of when IRAs and 401ks were created by ERISA in 1974. So what was the purpose of UBIT or unrelated business income tax, which is covered Internal Revenue Code sections 512, 513, 514. Essentially, Congress was concerned that companies like McDonald's, GE, for-profit businesses would set up a charity, a tax exempt, and then run their business through the tax exempt and never pay tax, right? Because charities do not pay tax. They're known as tax exempt. So they were concerned that that was going to happen. And that is why they set forth these rules that said, okay, if you're a tax exempt a hospital uh, or a, um, a not-for-profit that uh, delivers food to the needy, and you are going to engage in an activity that's unrelated to your exempt purpose, i.e. if a hospital sells, um, I don't know, cars or a, um, you know, a, a, a organization, tax exempt organization that feeds the needy, sells um, boxes or um, tables. We're going to treat that as an activity that's likely ex not related to its exempt purpose. And we're going to tax it as a business. But instead of taxing it based off individual or corporate tax rates, it's subject to the trust and estates tax rates, which have a very a much lower income threshold to triggering the highest tax rate. So, for example, in 2023, the highest trust in the state's tax rate is 37%. But that's triggered at $14,451. Whereas if you are an individual taxpayer, you would trigger the highest tax rate at approximately $650,000 or so. So it's a much lower threshold. So from zero to 2,900, it's about 10%. But any income under 1,000 bucks is not taxed. So you can argue from 1,000 to 2,900, it's about 10%. 2901 to 10,550 is 24%. 10,551 to 14,450 is 35%. And 37% is $14,451. So very, very low threshold, right? Especially um, inflation, the way uh, returns are being generated. 14,500 bucks is not uh, a huge amount of money. So 1974 comes around. Okay, so from the 50s to 1974, there's no IRAs, there's no 401ks. The UBIT rules are really focused on charities, tax exempts, you know, the Red Cross, hospitals, all your uh, run-of-the-mill charities. And there's lots of case law out there when charities got taxed and the UBIT tax applied when they engaged in activities that were unrelated to their exempt purpose. So you probably are not aware, and you maybe if you've listened to some of my podcast or watch some of my videos that if you go into a hospital, you'll notice that there's a gift um, shop, sell magazines, balloons, maybe not magazines anymore <laughs> with, with um, iPads and phones, but balloons and candy and chocolate and th 
things like that. And there's parking lots and they charge for parking. You'll may not notice, but now if you have to go into you know, a hospital, God forbid, but hopefully for a good thing, you'll notice that, uh, or you may not notice, but those services are outsourced, meaning someone will pay rent to run the candy store or someone will pay rent to lease the, the parking garages, pay a flat rental income to the tax exempt, and then they'll be the business that makes money off that facility. And this way, the rental income is exempt from UBIT. So now that we understand what is exempt purpose and not, let's talk about the categories of income that are exempt from UBIT. It's essentially all the passive income categories like capital gains, interest, dividends, royalties, rental income, right? All the passive categories, if you buy and sell stock or get interest on a note, rental income from a property, royalties on a trademark or patent, it's exempt from UBIT. So they're really going after business income, like i.e. selling widgets, selling magazines, selling chocolate bars, selling parking services. That is the income they're going after, right? Because the intent of the UBIT rules was to stop businesses to set up charities and run their business, not their passive activities, but their business through the charity. So that's what those rules try to do. Now, IRA is created in 1974, along with defined contribution 401k plans, and they're treated as a tax exempt, like a charity, right? They're 501 trusts. Most charities are 501Cs. IRAs, 401ks are taxed as 501A trusts, but they still are tax exempt, right? That's one of the main advantages of saving through an IRA or 401k is you don't pay tax on any of the income and gains generated by that exempt account, just like a charity. It doesn't pay any tax if it generates capital gains or interest or dividends or royalties or rental income or any income that is attributable and connected to its exempt purpose. The UBIT tax is only leveled on income that's not attributable or not connected to its exempt purpose. The problem with IRAs and 401ks is that it doesn't have an exempt purpose, right? It's not a hospital. It's not a charity that delivers food to the needy. Its only purpose is to grow, right? To say, So the IRA owner or 401k participant could put away more money and ultimately build the account up, right? So they have more money at retirement. That's essentially its only intent. It's only purpose. It doesn't have an exempt purpose otherwise. So it's somewhat unorthodox that the UBIT rules should apply to IRAs and 401ks, but unfortunately they do. And there was never put anything in the code, there was no provision that addresses the fact that IRAs and 401ks do not have an exempt purpose. So if it doesn't have an exempt purpose, how could something be an unrelated exempt purpose if it doesn't have an exempt purpose? Unfortunately, we're, we're living with the same rules that were put in the code in 74. There's nothing that has been added that restricts the application of the UBIT tax two IRAs and formal case. So there's really three ways that the UBIT tax could apply to an IRA or formal K investment. One, if it uses leverage alone to invest in an asset like stock, right? Margin to buy stock. Now, if you do, if you short stock or you buy options or you go long on stock, that is not the margin. Margin is considered like a loan, i.e. you have 50K in your IRA and you borrow 50K to buy more Tesla stock. That is margin loan, not when you um, are buying calls or, or shorting a stock or puts. Um, that's number one. Number two, use a non-recourse loan to buy real estate. Now, there's an exemption for 401ks under Section 514C9 that are allowed to use a non-recourse loan to acquire real estate. Don't ask why it applies to 401ks and not IRAs. The legislative history dating back to 1982 is not clear it seems like they want to give pension plans more investment rights, but the way the rules are drafted, it seems like the pension plan would have to invest in a partnership where only tax exempt are partners. So it's unclear if that exemption applies if the form K invests alongside other investors, non-exempt in a fund that has leverage. It's unclear if the 514C9 exemption would apply. Um, so that's kind of a little bit undetermined whether um, that would speak to its exempt purpose or not. And then thirdly, if you invest in an active trader business, remember not a passive activity, a trader business operates through a pass-through entity like an LLC. So not a corporation, 
That's why the UBIT tax does not apply to publicly traded companies, mutual funds, ETFs, and we'll see C-Corp blockers, because think of it as a C-Corp is a big box. It boxes in the income. It's subject to a corporate tax of a federal income tax of 21% on all net earnings as of 2023. And any retained earnings could be sent as a dividend to its shareholders. And there is a dividend tax of either ordinary income tax or if it's a qualified dividend from a publicly traded company, a reduced rate of uh, 15 or so percent. So that's where corporations have a, two levels of tax. And that's why the UBIT doesn't apply to corporation because there's already an entity level tax that applies, the corporate level tax of 21%. An LLC is a pass-through entity, right? There's no entity level tax. That's why a lot of, well, most people that set up businesses will set up LLCs or S-Corps if they're not seeking investors who would rather an S corp, uh, C corp, excuse me, like private equity fund, venture capital fund, because they don't want losses flowing through. They are content with having the losses stay in the corporation. But if you invest in an active trader business, like a restaurant or a store, consulting firm, that's an LLC, there's no entity level tax, there's no 21% tax. So that's where the UBIT tax comes in and taxes the business income allocated to the IRA at a maximum tax rate of 37%. Okay, so again, just to recap, three ways to trigger UBIT for an IRA or 401k. And you can call it UBIT or UBTI, it's the same thing. Okay, it's non-recourse loan to acquire an asset like stock, non-recourse loan to acquire real estate in an IRA. There's an exemption for 401ks. And if your IRA or 401k invests in an active trader business, like a restaurant, through a pass-through entity like an LLC, not a corporation. Now, why am I not saying S-Corps? Well, S-Corps have very peculiar shareholder rules, and actually an IRA cannot be a shareholder of an S-Corp. So if an IRA owns an S-Corp, the S-Corp election gets blown and it becomes a C-Corp. And 401k could technically own an S-Corp, but you're going to be in the same UBIT bucket, right? So it doesn't really help you. So LLCs, pass-throughs, or S-Corps of the 401k, will trigger UBIT. So how do you eliminate it? Okay, well, the only way to eliminate it is use, if you use a non-recourse loan to buy real estate, you do it in a 401k, 514.79 will eliminate UBIT. If you use margin to buy stock, well, that exemption for real estate acquisition would not apply to margin. It only applies to real estate, hard asset, hard real estate. Okay. Um, if you structure your investment as a loan and not investment, not an equity investment, but a loan, the interest on the investment and the principal paid back would be exempt from UBIT, right? Because remember I said, passive categories of income, capital gains, interest, dividends, royalties, rental income, they are exempt from UBIT. So if you turned your equity investment, instead of owning 5%, your IRA owning 5% in an entity, a pass-through entity, a restaurant, you lent the company the money, you don't get the upside of an equity ownership, right? If a business gets sold and you, you get a big stack of cash at the end, that's the advantage of being an equity owner versus a lender, you're getting a stated rate of return, whether it's 10%, 8%, 12%, whatever that note is, plus your money back. So um, you can structure your investment as a note versus an equity investment. Blocker corpse. So remember, we talked about C-Corps, right? And I said a C-Corp has a 21% tax rate maximum. And remember, I talked about the trust tax rates have a maximum tax rate of 37% of income over 14,451 bucks. So you can just do the simple math. Say, hey, if I had my IRA, invest in a blocker C-Corp, and then that C-Corp bought real estate with leverage, or that C-Corp invested into a business or a venture capital fund that invested in pass-through businesses or a private equity fund that invested in pass-through businesses or a real estate investment fund that used leverage by the real estate, I could reduce the 37% to 21%. Now I'm not eliminating the zero, but I'm gonna reduce it to 21%. And ultimately I just think that is the best course of action. I've done um, blogs and videos on using a foreign blocker like a Cayman, or a um, BVI, a Bridges Virgin Island Corporation. But in many cases, especially in real estate, you actually are gonna have higher taxes because there's something called FERPTA, Foreign Investment and Real Property Tax Act, 
which imposes a uh, withholding tax of potentially 10% of the gross. And then there's something called branch profit taxes, which imposes a tax on the activity of the U.S. business. It kind of creates a, a qualified dividend, even if no money is being repatriated, which could bring the total amount of taxes in the, in the 50%. If it's non-real estate, if all you're doing is generating capital gains, then there's potential use of a foreign blocker like Cayman because there's no backup withholding tax, meaning there's no withholding tax on any income being sent by the U.S. Corp to the foreign corp. If it's not real estate, it's not effectively connected, or and it's just capital gains or potentially interest, which can take advantage of what's called a portfolio interest exception, where there's no withholding tax on interest being paid by a U.S. company to a foreign company. But you have to satisfy the portfolio interest exception. Okay, which is not always possible. So it's really if you're just generating capital gains. If you're going to generate dividends or rental income, and it's a real estate asset or it's a business that could be subject to the branch profit tax, foreign blockers generally don't work. Um, they actually can trigger a higher tax. So that's why ultimately my suggestion, uh, putting my tax lower cap back on, is the C-Corp blocker. 37% UBIT tax is a killer. Hopefully you're going to be generating more than 14,451 bucks. So being able to reduce that 37% tax to 21% is a win. Now, obviously you don't pay UBIT tax if you have losses, right? If you have income of less than $1,000, there's no UBIT tax. So you got to, of course, understand the parameters of your business is or your investment. Is it an investment that's going to generate a lot of losses up front, potentially a lot of gain at the end? Okay, will that loan be paid off? If you pay off the loan 12 months prior to a sale of the real estate, there's no UBIT. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. Are you going to keep your real estate investment asset two years, one year, or 30 years? Um, are there going to be lots of losses? And then ultimately, maybe a capital gain sale at the end. That could lean well potentially for a foreign blocker. So these are the things that you obviously have to take into account. And I think one of the rewards of being a client of IRA Financial is you get access to you know, some really smart tax professionals um, that can assist you in navigating the UBIT rules and hopefully in structuring an investment that, that best takes advantage uh, of some of these exceptions and uh, some of the tax rules. So ultimately, if I had to give a blanket statement, I personally believe the domestic C-Corp blocker works. I would set up the C-Corp blocker in a state that has no state tax like Delaware, Wyoming, South Dakota. If you're a client of our financial, we can set you up with that corp. You can use our um, address in South Dakota as a registered agent for no fee. So you don't have to pay any state tax on that income. Whereas Florida, for example, has state um, tangible tax on corporations of 4% uh, or so. So you'd want to be in a state that has no state tax on corporate income. And yeah, I know 21 is not zero. 21 is not horrible. It's basically paying capital gains tax um, because if you take your capital gains tax, add the Obamacare to it, um, you're like at around 18%. So 21% is not horrible, not perfect, but ultimately it's probably your best bet in most instances, especially if you're doing real estate, because doing a foreign blocker generally is not going to be a better bet unless you're going to be investing in a very, very sophisticated um, real estate uh, fund that's going to be able to do um, what they call kind of leverage scaling, where they have some of your investment as a loan, some of it as an equity, and they can scale down um, the, the application of FERP and UBIT down probably close to 20%. But you're still going to be around that 20% number. So I always tell people just do a domestic C-Corp for IRAs and 401ks. Foreigners would rather have no exposure to any um, US entities. They'd rather invest indirectly because they don't want to have any connection to the IRS. But for IRAs and 401ks, we don't care about that. We're U.S. persons. Um, we're not a foreign person. Or we don't have we don't have the luxury of not, of not dealing with the IRS. We have to. So ultimately, at the end of the day, I just think the C corp blocker is the best bet. You you can at least hedge. You know what your costs are going to be. You know what the tax will be. You don't have to worry about filing a 990T, which is what and how UBIT's reported. Even though we do that for our clients, it's another tax form. It's another way of potentially getting audited. C Corp blocker, you file an 1120. We actually can do that for you as well if you're part of our annual compliance service. It's included, and we'll file the 1120 
and you pay the 21% no state tax. And you, you can kind of like basically um, understand what your costs are, right? And, and not have to worry about one year paying UBIT, next year not. You can um, stabilize costs across the board, which, which I think as an investor has some value. So that's my suggestion. Um, obviously we'd love to eliminate UBIT. Um, if you're just doing capital gains or interest, potentially you could through a foreign blocker with their cost of setting up a foreign blocker. Obviously, if you're doing real estate and you're self-employed, right? How do you get into a solo 401k? Self-employed, no full-time employees, over a thousand hours other than owners of their spouses. You set up a solo K, you acquire the real estate through a 401k, you can get around the application of the UBIT tax. But if you're in the IRA world, no such luxury. Ultimately, if the loan is outstanding and you have more than a thousand dollars in net income, you're going to get hit with UBIT, which obviously is not ideal, not great. So um, that's today's podcast. Um, it's all about education. Um, you know, sometimes, honestly, doing a real estate or other investment in an IRA or 401k that could trigger UBIT, you know, sometimes it's not the best course, right? If you can do it with personal funds and get a 15% capital gains tax rate versus 21% blocker, you know, maybe it makes sense. Um, the 37% is a killer. But bringing that down to 21, and there's really no cost involved since if you're part of our annual compliance service, we'll file the 1120. Like, I just think it's the way to go. You don't want to be messing around, not filing UBIT, not paying the tax on the 990T. It's just so much easier to just say, okay, I'm, I'm just going to go in. I know I'm going to hedge my, my costs. I know it's going to cost me the 21%, not 37%. I don't have to worry about 990Ts and UBIT. I just know what it's my, you know, my net cost of this investment is going to be. I just think ultimately that is probably for most IRA or Form K investors, the best course of action. So hope you guys enjoyed today's uh, podcast. It's a really important topic. UBIT doesn't get talked about enough, honestly, just because not enough people understand it, but um, I'm able to put at least my, uh, I didn't learn about this in law school either. Uh, I learned this as being a tax lawyer. Um, they didn't teach me this in law school. I have a master's in taxation. They, I never ever heard about UBIT. I learned this as a tax lawyer helping uh, hedge funds, private equity funds navigate and venture capital funds navigate UBIT um, through tax planning uh, you know, at very, very large law firms. So I'm happy I'm able to share some of this knowledge with you and, and protect you guys. That's the end of the day. The most important um, item is just really structuring in advance the investment. It's hard to restructure once you've invested. So hopefully I'm providing this education before you've done your investment. So now you understand blocker C Corp, foreign blocker, probably not an option, domestic C Corp blocker, or even you know potentially just saying, you know what, it's not gonna do it in a retirement account. I'm just gonna do it personally because I don't wanna deal with UBIT. And honestly, sometimes that's the that's, best that's answer. Uh, but for other folks that just wanna do it in an IRA because it's just available cash, they feel comfortable doing it, they wanna diversify, if you're going to get hit with you, but the C-Corp blocker um, at times is, is really your best bet. So thanks for spending some time with me. Um, definitely leave a comment. Give me a thumbs up if you don't mind. Appreciate it. And um, otherwise, uh, it's a weekly podcast. You guys know it drops every Wednesday. Done almost like 400 episodes. It's been tons of fun. So um, thanks for all the support. Have a great, great day. Great rest of your week. And I'll see everyone again next week. Ciao.